then we have our first um, poll question. How many pKa values are needed to calculate the PI, the isoelectric point of a polypeptide that is 18 amino acids long? And if you look in the upper left-hand corner right now, it prompts you with your join code. Uh, most people are using the app or accessing us through Canvas. Um, but there is also going to be a way that you can text your answer in. It will give you a number, a, a 10 digit number to text to, and then a specific like numeric code plus your answer is what you're going to text in. That changes every single question. So please don't try to text to the exact same number. Otherwise your answers will not be registered. All right, so start the question. Got about 10 seconds left on this question. And we are done. Okay. Um, these questions are also posted as homework questions that will open at 9 a.m. today and close tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, for those of you who are unable to answer these questions. Uh, and just the sidebar, I had a, a student asked me last class period about, um, well, what if I encounter technical difficulties during the questioning and I miss a question? Bro, who the fuck's like, bro? Excuse me? You fucking stupid. Excuse me. Nick or Micah, please mute yourself. And please be respectful of yourselves and myself and your peers with what you say during your microphone time. Call me a swear, but I don't particularly care for swearing. Okay, so what I was saying was somebody asked about, well, what if I miss a question? I And they said, should I do them for homework? And in the moment, I answered yes, but I'm going to reverse course on that. And I'm sorry, but, you know, I'm just... I've given it some more thought. You know, if you miss a question, I'm not going to say like, ooh, tisk, tisk, tisk. That's not my point. My point in asking these questions is to get a, a sense of where everyone is. So if you miss a question, okay, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I want to see, for you to get the participation points, I want to see that you answered at least one question. Now, if your operation is, oh, well, I'm going to answer one question, then dip out, I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. This is your grade. This is your content. So... I'm going to turn the camera off. Okay. So at any rate, are these graded for correctness? I've mentioned this before. They are not graded for correctness. They are graded based on participation. So that's what I'm looking for. Okay. So 41 out of 47 people answered this question. Our responses say, ooh, this is a good response. So I'm happy to see this. Okay. So we have something that's 18 amino acids long. Now, if you think about all of your different ionizable amino acids, there's a handful of them. You know, you've got arginine, lysine, tryptophan, ty or not tryptophan, tyrosine. Um, there's a handful of amino acids that are ionizable. In addition to that, for every single polypeptide, you always have two groups, the N termini and the C termini. So if you had a amino acid that was nothing but nonpolar or Okay, um, nonpolar or un or polar uncharged groups, then you would still have two pKa values that you could use to calculate your pI. So the correct answer is two. Whether there are twelve hundred pKa values or 
two pKa values. You can calculate a pI and it only requires two ionizable groups and two pKa values. So it doesn't depend how many. Instead, it just matters that you have two ionizable groups to calculate your pI. All right, so moving forward from there. Good job. Secondary structure, we're revisiting this. This is where we kind of took off the other day. We were talking about alpha helices and we were talking about different characteristics of an alpha helix. So first and foremost, you have a basically the space that an individual amino acid occupies and that equates to 1.5 angstroms. That's taking into account basically the X, Y, and Z planes that any amino acid is going to occupy. Now, within an alpha helix, you're going to have a rotation or a turn. And so I always think about that as like a spiral staircase. So if you're standing in a spiral staircase and someone is standing right above you, that would be one complete rotation. The space that uh, that occupies is about 5.4 angstroms. And we really look at that pretty much only in the um, y-axis. And we say that that is 5.4 angstroms. Now, when it comes to how many amino acids occupy that one rotation, well, it'd be about 3.6. Now this 3.6, that's not a hard and fast number, but you're not going to get a turn in an alpha helix that's made up of two amino acids. That 3.6 is pretty solid. If there's a, a range, it may be as few as three or as many as 4.2. So that's why we arrive at 3.6 as a uh, as a nice round number. It's not a round number, as a nice number that we use for this. Now, on average, the average helix is about 10 residues. And if you remember last time we did a little bit of a calculation, we said, okay, well, if a helix consists of 10 residues, how many turns was it? And if you remember last time, we came up with about three. The reason for that is if you have 3.6, or if, if one rotation is 3.6 angstroms, a second rotation is 3.6 more, then we're at 7.2, and a third rotation would get us to, you know, 10.8. So that would be um, 10.8 amino acids per uh, the average helix. Now, that's the average helix. Are there helices that are smaller than this or shorter than this and longer than this? Absolutely. You can have an alpha helix with basically as few as four amino acids or as many as 125 or even larger than that. Now, with that said, there's a little bit of a pattern. Now, the secondary structure is backbone hydrogen bond interactions. Now, when you think about a polypeptide, which is displayed down here at the bottom of the screen, we have an, a polypeptide denoted in yellow. We've got amino acid one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now the alpha helix is really only interested in the backbone hydrogen bonding groups. So your backbone hydrogen bonding groups are your carbonyl and your amino groups. Now, those carbonyl and amino groups, what they're capable of doing is they're capable of hydrogen bonding. So these guys right here, now I'm circling all of these because all of them can participate in hydrogen bonding and they will. The question is, are they participating in hydrogen bonding with other backbone groups with their environment? or maybe amino acid R groups, all of those are possible bonding pairs. Now, what we see whenever we look at an alpha helix is we have what's known as a right-handed spiral. And the idea with a right-handed spiral or a right-handed helix is use your left or right hand, okay? Now, selecting your right hand, have it face you. With your right hand facing you, your thumb is pointing upward. Now, the rotation of that alpha helix from N termini to C termini, my thumb is going up into that alpha helix. That 
what's what makes this a right-handed helix is the way that I fold my fingers in is going to resemble the rotation that my helix takes. So it's rotating upwards. There is also a left-handed helix, which the rotation of that helix, again, you're aligning the end terminis of these two helices with their C terminis. They're going to have a different rotation of those spiral staircases where they start and where they end. Okay, so that's what's defined by a right-handed helix. What you need to know for this is that, well, alpha helices have a right-handed shape. DNA and other helices might not have that right-handed shape. Now, with that in mind, the alpha helix is stabilized by an extensive hydrogen bond network. Now, here what we can see is six amino acids, and these red lines denote where there are hydrogen bonds that are being established. So, amino acid number one, hydrogen bonds, with amino acid number five. Now, is the R group a, a part of this calculation or consideration? No, it's not. The R group is not totally irrelevant, but it's not relevant to this part of our conversation. Okay, so amino acid one pairs up with, or the C termini of amino acid one, hydrogen bonds with the N termini of amino acid number five. This is what's known as R or Sorry, this is what is known as I to the I plus four hydrogen bond. Now, that's significant because, well, amino acid two, this I to I plus four pattern, that's important to know because that I is going to change. Well, if we substitute I with one, then that is the C termini of amino acid one hydrogen bonds with the N termini of amino acid five. Then two is going to hydrogen bond with the N termini of six, three with seven, four with eight, five with nine, and so on. Now all these alpha helices, or sorry, all these hydrogen bonds, they are parallel to that helical axis, axis, sorry. So if you look at your thumb as your central axis, these hydrogen bonds are all going to be parallel to that central axis. Now, the last four residues at either end of the alpha helix participate only in one hydrogen bond. And what's meant by that is, let's take amino acid number one as our example. The C termini of amino acid number one is going to participate in a hydrogen bond, whereas the N termini, chances are that's a free amine. Now it's easy to, or I think that it's easy to visualize when you're talking about amino acid number one to five, but if you're talking about amino acid number, you know, something in the middle of a polypeptide, so 320 to 324, well, what's amino acid 324 going to participate in? It's not going to participate in the hydrogen bond. The N termini is not. The C termini might, but the N termini will not. Because those last four residues, so if we look at one, two, three, four, the last four residues at either end of that helix partic participate only in one hydrogen bond. All right, so what that is ultimately going to give us is a nice image that looks like such. So we have our, uh, sorry, part of my screen is obscured. We have our I to the I plus four bond. And if you look at the model on the right-hand side, what do you think these yellow shapes are. When we think about a polypeptide, add to the chat or say it aloud, the R groups. Absolutely right. So your R groups are protruding out of or parallel or perpendicular to your central axis. So your R groups are out uh, and kind of pointing outward from your, your alpha helix. Now, this right here 
So that's one thing that you, you should keep in mind with respect to the shape and the structure of a um, polypeptide in an alpha helix. So the helical wheel is a way of visualizing that. And I think that it's really helpful because it gives you a sense of where spatially different R groups are and different amino acids are. So this gives you a mechanism to take a linear polypeptide and basically position different R groups. So if we start with amino acid number one, your R group is at basically the 12 o'clock position. Your next R group for number two is at mm, probably about the four o'clock position on the face of a clock. Then three is nearly at six o'clock, not directly across from the one, so it's at maybe 6.30 or so. Four is at 10 to 10.30, Five is at basically one o'clock if you're looking at the face of a clock. So ultimately, what we're going to get is all of our amino acids displayed. And one of the things that I want you to notice about this is that not all of your amino acids are directly on top of one another. Instead, you see what's almost like a staggering. Now, just to jog back a second, if we think about the distance that different amino acids are from one another, how high or how far in space is amino acid number one from amino acid number five? It's roughly 5.4 angstroms, maybe a little bit more than that, but that's a little bit more than one complete rotation. So in space on your y-axis, it's about 5.4 angstroms. Now, when we think about these um, different helices coming together. You have all of these R groups that are protruding outward. Now, we talked about quite a bit the composition and the classification of different amino acids. We classified them as polar and nonpolar, polar positive, polar negative, polar uncharged. Those R groups are now displayed outward. What do you think that they're going to do? Well, polar positive groups that are displayed outward, they're going to attract polar negative groups, or they're going to attract, or they're going to participate in some sort of ionic interaction or a hydrogen bond or something of that nature. That's significant because one of the things that we will see is that alpha helices, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a very simplistic model of a lipid bilayer. Here's a quick and dirty lipid bilayer. One of the things that we will see whenever we talk about membrane proteins, so here's, a, here's an example of an alpha helix. There are membrane proteins that have lots of different helices. You know, maybe as many as five or six alpha helices. And so there's our, our kind of side angle view. But then let's take a look at the top down view of it. Uh, here, I'm gonna give a fifth one up there. Here's our five alpha helices. Those five alpha helices, well, they're kind of in contact with one another. I'm gonna switch colors so I can illustrate that. They're in contact with one another here, 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 here and here. So they have stable interactions between different, they have ionic pairs that cause them to interact with one another, or they're, they've got nonpolar groups causing them to interact with one another. Now, what's going to happen is sometimes these proteins undergo a shape change and they go from well, they, they undergo minor changes, and what those minor changes will result in is something like this. Now, what I really want to illustrate here is this central cavity that I'm coloring in with green. That central cavity will open up. And what that central cavity opening up will do is it will allow for maybe ions like sodium to flow from one side of a membrane to another side of a membrane. 
or they'll allow small molecules like glucose to go from one side of a membrane to the other side of the membrane. And what this is all stabilized by is nonpolar, as an example, nonpolar, nonpolar interactions between alpha helices. And those different groups can be mapped out using something like a helical wheel. So that you can basically take the primary structure of a protein and position all of the different amino acids. And you can do something where you look at it and you say, oh, well, as it turns out, all of these residues right here, amino acid 12, 5, 9, and 2, those are all arginines. Hmm, interesting. And then we've got another alpha helix with another helical wheel that we mapped it out. And, oh, it's a bunch of um, serines, a bunch of serines, a bunch of serines and a bunch of uh, leucine, or sorry, um, a bunch of serines and um, aspartic acids. So we've got contacts that are based on ionic charges. Now, that's one of the benefits of being able to map out a helical wheel so you can see where different amino acids are in 3D space and come up with a better sense of what does a protein look like in 3D. Now, when it comes to the overall structure of that alpha helix, an alpha helix is going to possess a dipole moment because each peptide is going to have a dipole. It's going to have a part partial positive and a partial negative charge. Now, is it overall going to have a total positive charge or negative charge? No, it's not. Good. It's going to have those partial charges. The N termini of the overall helix will have a partial positive charge, and the C termini is going to have a partial negative charge. Now, what we're going to look at and what we're kind of curious about with this and all this information that we can use for a alpha helix is this right here. So an alpha helix has 15 amino acids. Can you calculate the number of angstroms that alpha helix is going to cover? Okay, so we've got a couple different pieces of information. 15 amino acids. Okay, what do we know? Each amino acid, 1AA, is approximately 1.5 angstroms. We know that from one of our previous slides. And I'm open this right here. Then we're going to get this other information. So, um, 1.5 angstroms per amino acid, and then one rotation is about 5.4 angstroms, and there's about 3.6 amino acids per rotation. So let's jump back to this. 1.5 angstroms per amino acid, one rotation or turn is 5.4 angstroms, and then one rotation is 3.6 AA. Okay, so what can we use this information for? Well, one piece of information that we can do is, or that we can come up with is how many angstroms that alpha helix is going to cover. We could say 15 amino acids. Oh, damn it. One turn or one rotation is about 3.6 residues. So we'd come up with that alpha helix, that's 15 amino acids, is about 4.2 turns. So we're looking at something that looks a little bit like this. One, two, three. There's one turn, there's a second, a third, and then a fourth. Okay. So let me actually OK. 
Okay, so first rotation, second, third, and fourth. Now, next up, we could calculate that this is approximately 22.7 angstroms tall from our starting point down here all the way up to here. It's about 22.7 angstroms. Now, you could do this calculation in a slightly different way, where you would take the approximate measurement of one amino acid, 1 1.5, 15 divided by 1 point, or 15 times 1.5, and you'd come up with about 22.5 angstroms. Now, the point of this is when you look at these different calculations, well, there's a slight variation, but that's just because these numbers reflect averages. On an exam or anything else, your numbers are going to be different enough that you don't have to, or you're um, you're not going to get, I'm not going to give you answer option 22.7 versus 22.5. Now, with that in mind, this is the sort of question that I will ask you. This is where this is relevant because we're trying to visualize these molecules in the context of a biological molecule or a biological system. A 40 angstrom membrane, okay, so a lipid bilayer, that's 40 angstroms wide. How many amino acid residues are required to fold into an alpha helix that would span that membrane? So essentially what you can do is you have, and just so I can provide a, more of a visual, here's our membrane. This is 40 angstroms. Okay. Now, this is not asking you about the it's not giving you information about the alpha helix, but instead asking you, can this span this distance? So 40 angstroms. One turn is approximately 5.4 angstroms. So 40 divided by 5.4 is going to give you 7.4. So there's approximately 7.4 turns in this alpha helix that spans this distance. The next question is, well, approximately how many, how many amino acids make up that alpha helix? Well, 7.4 turns, and each turn is 3.6 residues. You're looking at 26.7 residues. If you were to do this calculation in a slightly different way, 40 divided by 1.5, you're going to get 26.7 residues. All right, so... Which of the following alpha helix lengths can span? So this is that same question, but asked in a slightly different way. Or given answers that's that are slightly different. All right, one second left. Tenzo. So our responses, 10, 20, 30, and none of these can span that. We just did this calculation and we came up with, if it was 40 angstroms, we would need 26.7. So 26.7 angstrom, or 26.7 amino acids are required to span a membrane. So, could a 10 angstrom or 10 amino acid um, alpha helix span a 40 angstrom membrane? Another way to look at this is, well, basically, if one amino acid is 1.5 angstroms and you've got 10 amino acids, how long is that? Well, that's just 10 times 1.5. That gets you 15 angstroms. 
20 times 1.5. It's going to be 30 angstroms. Okay. 15 and 30 are not the same as 40. So 30 times 1.5 is going to give us 45 angstroms. So essentially, C is the best answer, the most viable answer. And let's see if that is marked correct. Yes, it is. Okay. So did we have to do anything with respect to determining how many rotations were in this? No, that wasn't a part of this question. This was just about how long is that um, protein. Next question. How many turns will this 40 angstrom alpha helix have? This is a little bit more complicated. But it's also something that you can kind of do in a slightly different way. So 40 angstroms, how many rotations? Thinking about 1.6 angstrom, or sorry, 3.6 angstroms, 3.6 amino acids per rotation. All right, so we've got 40 angstroms. I think a good way to approach this is just by process of elimination. So how many rotations will we have if it's 40 angstroms? Are we going to have roughly 40? No, that's not a good answer. Roughly 20. Hmm, let's think about that one. 40 angstroms. And then we have 5.4 angstroms per one turn. So 40 divided by 5.4. And we're going to get 40 divided by 5.4 gets a 7.407. .407. Thanks, Andrew. You're right. So for this, you know, I would not give you this question on an exam, or if I did, I would give it as a basically an open-ended question. Um, I think your best answer here, considering that we are dealing with a little bit of averages, roughly seven, D. Now, let's see where our responses were. 28 folks answered uh, roughly seven. I can see why... Some people also picked 10 because they probably were like, well, I'm going to round up on that one. Equally good answer, which is, so there we go. So I see your question now, Andrew Wade, isn't this the 5.4 angstroms? Yes, you're right. Okay, so our second major, our second major uh, secondary structure of a protein is known as a beta sheet. This is known as, as an extended conformation. And if you remember, one of the measurements that, Angst, uh, that Asbury came up with was that he saw periodic repeats of 3.5 to 7 angstroms. Now, the alpha helices, we saw some rotations there, but the beta sheets were another element that's a little bit more complicated. And they're also considered a local structure but we have two major classifications of a beta sheet. They are an anti-parallel and a parallel beta sheet. Okay, so the tough part about the anti-parallel beta sheet versus the parallel beta sheet is not necessarily understanding the, the terms, but understanding how that could take place. If you think about an alpha helix, let's go ahead and take our linear alpha helix. Here's our N or C, 
And this shows the directionality and the anti-parallel shows N going to C and then oppositely N going to C. How would that... Okay, so I'm getting a separate message about the last question. I thought 10 because one rotation is about 3.5 amino acids, so one turn is 5.4 angstroms. Yes, yes. So parallel versus anti-parallel beta sheets. Okay, an anti-parallel beta sheet has basically two parts of the same polypeptide going in opposite directions. Now, how's that going to take place? Because if we do just a rotation like this, this would be the N termini of the polypeptide, and this would be a C terminal portion of this polypeptide. This would then be the N termini and the C terminal portion of this polypeptide. So this displays an anti-parallel. So if you have a single loop like this, okay, so that one's a little bit straightforward. How about the opposite, a parallel? beta sheet. Well, how would you get the N termini of two portions of the polypeptide to basically wrap in on itself? In order to do that, you're going to end up with something that looks a little bit like this. And I'm going to highlight in green the regions where the... Um, yeah, so this green region is where the strands of our... our sheets line up and then here is where they line up as well. So here is N to C, N to C. So this is anti-parallel right here and then this is parallel. Now looking at those two and looking at the zoomed in models of these, which one do you think is stronger? And add a Y. Wrapped around has less stairs. Wrapped around, are you referencing the parallel? Or which one do you think? You said the Y, but I didn't see your... Okay, so the one that's stronger might come as a little bit of a surprise. I think parallel for the same reason, okay. So it's actually the anti-parallel that's a little bit stronger. And the reasoning behind that is if you look at the hydrogen bonds, this is an important part of these. This and this are our hydrogen bonds versus this and this. Now, our anti-parallel is stronger because those hydrogen bonds or the hydrogen bond donor and acceptor pairs are directly across from one another. So they are uh, linear, whereas our parallel ones are basically elongated and at an angle. So parallel beta sheets are weaker than their anti-parallel counterparts. Now, with that said, a beta sheet can have a combination. It's not just exclusively parallel or exclusively anti-parallel, you can have a mixture of them. And when it comes to, well, what's stronger uh, between mixed, anti, or parallel, it's ultimately going to boil down to which percentage or which fraction of it is anti-parallel. The greater the abundance of the anti-parallel beta sheets, the little bit stronger that it's going to be. So there we go. Um, now, large beta sheets, has anyone ever heard of GFP? And does anyone know what GFP stands for? GFP is absolutely right, Morgan. It's the green fluorescent protein. Now, that's a very important protein from the cell, bio cell biology perspective because it allows you to visualize where something is, where a protein goes. It's great for basically tracking a protein, you can make a fusion of any protein and GFP, 
And then you can see, oh, well, where does my protein go? Well, it's fused to GFP. GFP goes into the uh, chloroplast. Okay, well, now I'm working with a chloroplast protein. Now, large beta sheets, and I bring that up just because these large beta sheets can form really pretty interesting structures. Here, what we have is the tertiary structure of a protein, the 3D structure of a protein, where in the center, it's a series of kind of... Um, anti-parallel beta sheets that have this kind of angular structure and then it puts alpha helices on the periphery. Now, beta sheets can also, also form what's known as a beta barrel structure, which is what GFP does. And the cool thing about that is that it basically looks like a big cylinder and at the exact center of that molecule is where you're going to find the green fluorophore that helps GFP illuminate. Now, the connections between the strands can be simple or they can be very complex. They can be simple loops or they contain additional secondary structures such as alpha helices. Now, when we look at this structure over on the right-hand side, I think that picking out the alpha helices and beta sheets is kind of easy. But then if you look at these parts right out here, you might think, well, that just looks like a random coiling of a protein. And that's absolutely what it is. So when you think about the tertiary structure of a protein, not everything fits into the mold of alpha helix or a beta sheet. There are random coils that kind of fill in the, the blanks between those. As I mentioned previously, and as uh, Andrew answered, when it comes to your alpha helix, your R groups are protruding out of the structure, whereas in your beta sheets, they're going to be, they are like, they are ultimately relevant. Um, side chains cover and protect the backbone hydrogen bonds and, and they can lead to charge charge repulsion, favorable ionic interactions. And what ultimately matters for secondary structure is the location of individual amino acids. Now, when it comes to an alpha helix, there is a preference. So our groups do have an impact on a secondary structure because what they can do is they can encourage it or facilitate it or they can disrupt it and break it. So the coil of an alpha helix constrains the space between adjacent and vertical amino acids. You've got your I to I plus four pattern. Now the preference for amino acids and more likely to be forming or to be found in an alpha helix is smaller and less bulky amino acids and extended or non-beta branched amino acids. So that beta branching is relevant to thinking about your amino acid, you have your alpha carbon and then your beta carbon that comes off of that. A beta branched amino acid would be something like isoleucine. Whereas an extended amino acid that's not beta branched would be something like um, lysine. Um, <clears throat> You've got favorable ionic, so any amino acids that provide favorable ionic interactions are also going to be good candidates for um, forming an alpha helix. Alanine, glutamic acid, methionine, leucine, phenylalanine, glutamine, histidine, lysine, arginine are all great candidates for um, alpha helix formation. Beta sheets, on the other hand, the extended structure of beta sheets leaves the maximum space for amino acid side chains. So what that means is you cannot uh, you can accommodate larger amino acids. Large bulky side chains prefer to form those beta sheets. For example, tyrosine, tryptophan, methionine, or phenylalanine. Those are just plain large amino acids. Bulky and awkward residues that are uh, beta branched like isoleucine, valine, and threonine are more likely to be form found in beta sheets. Now, that large carbon atom of something like cysteine is also going to present a opportunity or is more likely to be found in a beta sheet. Now, all of this was summed up, and I'm going to jog ahead just a little bit. First, or before I get to the, the last slide that I want to talk about, is there are some secondary structure breakers. So there are amino acids that basically disrupt a secondary structure. And that secondary structure would be an alpha helix or a beta sheet. Glycine is an amino acid that's entirely too flexible because if you remember glycine, what is the side chain? It's just the hydrogen. Proline, 
is also a secondary structure breaker because of the fact that it's just a ring and it, that ring goes back to the end termini. So it has a very rigid structure. So I like to contrast these two amino acids. Lysine is too flexible, proline is too rigid. So they both restrict uh, secondary structure formation. Now, proline is never going to be found in the center of an alpha helix. Strong hydrogen bonding side chains compete directly with backbone interactions. They can also cause problems. So that means that asparagine and serine, two residues that love to hydrogen bond, will present a problem and they're less likely to be found. Whenever you hear secondary structure breakers, however, I want you to think proline and glycine. There are kind of a next tier or a lower tier um, secondary structure breakers, and that's what I'm going to get to in this right here. This table right here. So this is a table from a review article from 1978. Chow and Fassman are the authors of this paper. Um, I cannot remember their first names, but this is the Chow Fassman prediction model. Essentially what these two researchers did was they took all of the protein structure data of the day and they basically assigned and looked at protein structures and said, oh, is an amino acid found in an alpha helix? Is it found in a beta sheet? And they came up with a scoring system. And this is something that has been refined over the years. And what they did was they said, okay, well, um, what we never find in an alpha helix, or virtually never find in an alpha helix, is a glycine residue. We also virtually never find a glycine in a beta sheet. Okay, so we're gonna give those low scores. Are they ever found? Yeah, more than zero, but pretty rarely. And they came up with this P sub alpha and P sub beta numbering scheme. And P stands for propensity. So the propensity for an alpha helix, propensity for a beta sheet. This is awesome and this is hugely powerful because these scores and this scoring system, as it continues to evolve, gives a way to predict protein structure. Is anyone familiar, like everyone knows the parent company of Google, Alphabet. Um, is anyone familiar with the protein folding prediction scheme or project that they have ongoing? I'll give you a hint, it starts with alpha. So they have this actively ongoing project to predict protein structure, and it's known as AlphaFold. And this is hugely powerful because essentially right now, if you want to know what a protein looks like in three dimensions, you have to either do NMR or solve the crystal structure of that protein. And both of those things have limitations. And... NMR has like size limitations, but they also present technical challenges and technical limitations. Um, essentially what they are looking to do with a project like AlphaFold is take the primary structure of a protein and predict what it looks like in three dimensions. And I bring that up because there was a time when you could not do that with the secondary structure. But because of the work of Chow and Fassman, now what you can do is take the primary structure of a protein and predict whether an alpha helix or a beta sheet forms. Okay, we're gonna revisit some of this. Um, in terms of the scaling, is it a logarithmic scaling? Um, I really, I would imagine as much just because the scale ranges from zero to two, but obviously nothing reaches a zero. Is that your question? Okay, great. Um, we'll pick up with some of this on Monday. Uh, I hope you guys have a great weekend. Thank you for coming to class. Um, please be a little bit more careful with what uh, what you're uh, broadcasting whenever you're joining the, the lecture. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye.